Education is what's important. Training, preparation for the expected. Education, preparation for the unexpected. All right, good afternoon, Team Krulak community. And on behalf of Marine Corps University, the Marine Corps University Foundation, and the Brute Krulak Center for Innovation and Future Warfare, welcome back to the Brutecast, our series designed to connect the worlds of the warfighter and PME with the best in innovative and creative thought. I'm your host, Major Ian Brown, the Operations Officer at the Krulak Center. Before we begin, please remember that all opinions expressed here are those of the individual and do not reflect the views of the Krulak Center, Marine Corps University, the United States Marine Corps, or any other agency of the U.S. government. So today we're excited to offer you the first panel event of our academic year, and I'm extremely grateful to both Dr. Amin Tarzi of Middle East Studies here at the Krulak Center, as well as the American Academy of Arts and Sciences to all the groundwork that went into putting this together. Our guests will be talking about the Civil Wars, Violence, and International Responses Project conducted under the Academy. And let me start things off with some introductions for our panelists. So first we have Dr. Michelle Berry. She's the Drs. Ben and A.J.S. Jensen Endowed Professor of Medicine and Tropical Diseases, Director of the Center for Innovation and Global Health, and Senior Associate Dean of Global Health in Stanford. She is the current Chair of the Board of Directors for the Consortium of Universities for Global Health, an elected member of the National Academy of Medicine, the American Academy of Arts and Sciences, and the Council for Foreign Relations. She's a passionate educator and clinician and has sent over 2,000 physicians around the world to create and contribute to innovative global health programs. As founder of Women Lift Health, she is a leader in the movement for women's leadership in medicine and global health, and is also a recipient of both the Elizabeth Blackwell Medal for Outstanding Contributions to Women in the Field of Medicine and the Ben Keen Medal for Dedication to Clinical Tropical Medicine and Impact on the Training of Students, Fellows, and Practitioners. Her scholarly interests include emerging, pan emerging pandemic diseases, human and planetary health, and the impact of globalization on health. Our next guest is Professor Steve Haydman, who holds the Janet Wright Ketchum 1953 Chair in Middle East Studies at Smith College with a joint appointment in the Department of Government. He is also a non-resident senior fellow in the Center for Middle East Policy of the Brookings Institution. From 2007 to 2015, he held a number of leadership positions at the U.S. Institute of Peace in Washington, D.C., including Vice President of Applied Research on Conflict and Senior Advisor for the Middle East. He is a political scientist who specializes in the comparative politics and the political economy of the Middle East. His interests include authoritarian governance, conflict and post-conflict reconstruction, economic development, social policy, political and economic reform, and civil society. Among his many publications are The Syrian Conflict, Proxy War, Pyrrhic Victory, and Power Sharing Agreements, Rethinking Social Contracts in the MENA Region, Economic Governance, Contingent Citizenship, and State Society Relations After the Arab Uprisings, and numerous other books and publications and articles. Next, we have Stephen, or Professor Stephen Krasner, who is the Graham H. Stewart Professor of International Studies. Krasner is also S FSI Senior Fellow and a Senior Fellow of the Hoover Institution. In 2002, he served as Director for Governance and Development at the National Security Council, where he worked primarily on the Millennium Challenge account. In 2005 to April 2007, he served as Director of Policy Planning at the U.S. State Department. And since 2009, he has been a member of the Board of Directors of the United States Institute of Peace. He's been a fellow at the Center for Advanced Studies in the Behavioral Sciences and at the Wissenschaft <laughs> Calling Zoo Berlin. Since 2014, he has been Marketer Fellow at the Free University in Berlin. He's also a member of the Council on Foreign Relations. And his work deals primarily with sovereignty, American foreign policy, and the political determinants of international economic relations. And finally, we're very grateful to welcome Ambassador Carl Eikenberry. He's former U.S. Ambassador to Afghanistan and a retired Lieutenant General in the United States Army. He's a senior advisor to the Saudi Arabia Ministry of Defense on its Defense and Military Transformation Plan. He's also a faculty member of Schwarzman College, Shunga University, Beijing, China. From 2011 to 2019, he was the director of the U.S. Asia Security Initiative at the Walter H. Shorenstein Asia Pacific Research Center, Stanford University. He was also an affiliate with the Stanford University Freeman Spogli Institute for International Studies, Center for International Security and Cooperation, Center for Democracy, Development and Rule of Law, and the Europe Center. Prior to his arrival at Stanford, he served as the U.S. Ambassador to Afghanistan from 2019 until 2011. Before appointment as Chief of Mission in Kabul, Ambassador Eikenberry had a 35-year career in the United States Army, retiring with the rank of Lieutenant General. 
His military operational post included as commander and staff officer with mechanized light airborne and ranger infantry units in the continental United States, Hawaii, Korea, Italy, and as the commander of the American led coalition forces in Afghanistan. So my thanks to everybody for joining us on the panel today and Ambassador Eikenberry, I'll turn things over to you for some opening comments, sir. Hey, great. I know, uh, Ian, on behalf of all my colleagues, uh, thanks to Marine Corps University for uh, co-hosting this. And as always, thanks to the American Academy of Arts and Sciences and specifically to the uh, president, David Oxenby, who's uh, been uh, just terrific with his sustained support for our project. You know, you, you had said, uh, that I'm in Riyadh, Saudi Arabia, in your introduction there. And so I know it's later here than anywhere else for anybody watching. And I guarantee, although it's 8.15 p.m. here in the evening, it's hotter here than anywhere else that anybody is watching from. Uh, I'd like to start off with just a few brief words about our project. Uh, Ian, you introduced at this uh, civil wars, interstate violence, and international response effort that the Academy uh, brought together about five years ago, five years ago plus now. Steve, uh, Steve Krasner and I were the, uh, and are the uh, co-leaders for this. Uh, Steve and I, when we were together at uh, Stanford University, uh, Steve, a distinguished <laughs> professor of political science there, uh, we had both uh, had our own experiences with uh, countries afflicted with interstate violence, civil wars, uh, made for some years in Afghanistan and uh, briefer years in Iraq. And Steve with uh, policy planning in the Department of State under the Bush administration, uh, good friends before that, uh, but we talked a, a good bit at uh, Stanford uh, when we were together in 2014, 2015, and then came upon this idea of examining the threats that interstate violence and civil wars pose to the United States and to uh, global security. So with the generous support then from the American Academy, we brought together uh, some 36 academics, policy practitioners, people with media background, United Nations, health experts like, uh, like uh, Michelle here, uh, experts on the Middle East like uh, Stephen, a very eclectic, and uh, a very distinguished group. It is really an honor to uh, lead the effort with uh, Steve. At any rate, uh, we brought them together, seven countries represented, and then over a period of several years, we uh, put together two volumes of the American Academy of Arts and Sciences quarterly journal, Daedalus, and we organized those in a section on threats some on the, uh, the implications, challenges, and then the third section on possible international responses. After that, uh, we went out and had a set of engagements in Washington, D.C. with all branches of the uh, government, went up to New York for discussions with the U.N., uh, took the project to uh, Europe, it had very interesting engagement in Nigeria and Beijing, and then Steve and I sat down in touch with our colleagues and produced uh, what we call an occasional paper, which is what this uh, discussion is focused on. Uh, we've had also a set of outreach events beyond this one. Uh, Steve and I and several of our colleagues came together and had uh, several weeks ago a very uh, good session with UN peacekeeping operations. So let me stop here. And the way we're going to divide this up is Steve, uh, Steve Krasner, then we'll talk more about the big ideas of the occasional paper. Steve uh, went on to uh, write a very uh, excellent book, which expands upon this uh, theme of good enough governance. Uh, Stephen Hedeman uh, will talk about the Middle East, but a very, very interesting insights into uh, how you have to look at uh, rebuilding economies of countries that are still engaged in civil war or trying to recover uh, therefrom. And then Michelle will uh, conclude with the discussion of the threats posed in countries that are afflicted with interstate violence, with pandemics and the spread of uh, infectious disease. So over to you, Steve. So Carl, thank you very much. Thanks for the Marine Corps University for having us. I'll run through these slides, I think, pretty quickly, but uh, 
I was struck a couple of days ago. Um, we had a session, we had a session with the commander of Southcom, Admiral Fowler. And Admiral Fowler emphasized the importance to the United States, both of spreading democracy and of securing our national interest. And the basic argument I want to make here is that it might not be possible for us to do both of those things. And especially in securing democracy is something that depends much more in luck and happenstance. And it's very difficult for external actors to do it. Uh, so I did this book in 2020. I realized that this is a problem that I've been thinking about my whole life. Okay, if we look at the world as it is now, it's actually very difficult to get into the OECD world. So the number of countries that have been consolidated democracies and had high levels of wealth are very limited in time and very limited in space. So they exist in North America and Western Europe and East Asia. Uh, if you think about the time that human beings have been on Earth, 100,000, 200,000 years, they've existed maybe for 200 years. If you look at most of human history, um, government has been run by autocratic regimes, which are exclusive, closed access. If there's any rule of law at all, it's only open to the elite. They've been raid-seeking, they've been exploitative, and they've been violent. So for most of human history, that's been the fate of most people, most homo sapiens that have lived on Earth. Uh, if we look at per capita income, well, actually, the Industrial Revolution is the beginning of a separation in per capita income among different areas of the world. If you went back to, say, 1800, uh, there was a gap of maybe four to, four to one if you looked at the U.S. versus Western Europe. That gap has grown tremendously in the last 30 years. So if you look at the gap that exists in be, among different areas of the world now between, say, the United States on the one hand and poor countries in Africa on the other, they're much greater than existed in the past. So the simple fact that we've gotten technology may be great uh, for countries that have been able to take advantage of it, but most companies, countries by and large are not been able to take granted advantage of it. So growth has taken place in some parts of the world, but not in other parts. So I think that, you know, so the, the problem I think is to explain why you have a small number of countries that are both democratic and rich. So I think that democracy and wealth are things that go along together. Um, if you're going to get wealthy, you have to be willing to make an investment. If, if, you, if you're willing to make an investment, you have to think that the state is not going to simply take it away from you. Madison argued in Federalist Papers 51, if men were angels, we wouldn't need government. But men are not angels, so we do need government. But we need a government which is both efficient, efficient and limited, and that's been actually very, very, a very rare occurrence. So I think there are three theories that explain how we've gotten to this place where you're both wealthy and democratic. There's modernization theory, institutional capacity, and elite competition and bargaining. I want to speak about each of these uh, without running <coughs> over my time too much. So if we look at modernization theory, I think it's, in, it's something that all of us are, are familiar with. Um, basically, you get high levels of income, you get a large middle class. A large middle class supports democracy. All good things go together. You get wealthy, you get democratic at the same time. It's been kind of a story in the United States over the last, you know, 180 years, 160 years. Um, this argument about of modernization theory has been tested extensively by social scientists. And there is certainly a lot of, of evidence supporting it. So the countries that have been democratic and well, uh, you know, I've all been countries that have been relatively wealthy, that there's no country that's really, well, there are a few countries that are democratic now, that are wealthy now that are not democratic, but they're mainly oil producers. But not all of the evidence points in the same direction. So, you know, there's a very good relationship between democracy and wealth up to about $10,000. But once you get above $10,000, you don't necessarily become democratic. So if you look at China now, maybe it will transition into democracy. That was certainly our bet 10 years ago. It doesn't look like a very good bet now.
Um, it's also the case that if you look at poor countries, it bounced back and forth between autocracy and democracy. It's not as if democracy develops only at high levels of income. Democracy develops even if you have low levels of income, but the democracies don't last very long. So um, if you look at modernization theory, there's a lot of evidence supporting it, but there's also some real evidence not supporting it. And I would think about China. You know, the question is, do we think China is going to become a democracy? Ten years ago, we thought they'd be just like us. It turns out that they haven't been just like us. Uh, the second theory that's focused on um, how you get to be wealthy and democratic is institutional capacity. And it's basically an argument that says you have to have a stable government if you want to be wealthy. And certainly this began, I mean, with Hobbes, you know, life in the state of nature is the nasty British in short. In the 17th century, just experienced the Civil War in, in England, where many, many hundreds of thousands of people were killed. In, in more re recent years, certainly Samuel Huntington has made this argument. Probably Frank Fukuyama, our colleague at Stanford, has also made this argument. Uh, but if you're looking at institutional capacity, the escalator goes up, but it also may go down. Uh, you may get consolidation, but you may not. Now, the question obviously is, how does consolidation take place? And here there's no consensus. Um, so we look at looking at sources of institutional capacity. The one that's most often referred to as war makes the state and state makes war. So um, this illustration that I have here is an Egyptian king. It's actually the first illustration we have of a human being. And you can see that it's clubbing someone to death. And the classic argument here was made by Tilly, who was a historical sociologist at Columbia. Um, and it was an argument which works very well if you think about Prussia sitting in the middle of Europe. It doesn't have natural boundaries. If you didn't want to be conquered, you had to be strong. Well, it's true that Prussia did become strong and ultimately became Germany. Um, Poland was actually in the same geographic situation. And there was lots of arguments, and Poland sort of disappeared from the map of Europe entirely for for about a hundred years. So there, so war makes the state, state makes war. It's one argument, certainly not perfect. Second argument is the argument of social coalitions, which appear a, applies very well to the United States after the Civil War. Third argument is the argument about colonialism, and people have argued that it, it was better be to be colonized by the British. And the Japanese, especially in Korea, they introduced industry, they abolished um, large land holdings. There's an argument also about religion, which is that people who are essentially Calvinist, so this is after the Protestant Reformation, thought that they had to defend the state. And the final argument, um, which I think is an argument that's made mainly by economists in the United States, Okay, I think this is the best argument. Um, it is that you get to be wealthy and you get to be democratic if elites think it's a good idea to be wealthy and democratic. Now, why would elites ever do that? Um, elites are strategic. To think about staying in power, thinking about staying in power gives them wealth. It also gives them prestige. Um, and it doesn't necessarily happen. It takes a lot of luck. That's this argument of path dependence. So you have random events. And it's no teleology. There's no necessity that people are going to become wealthy and democratic. We've kind of assumed that they would, and it's a great thing if you do, but it doesn't necessarily happen to everybody. Next. So if we think about Britain, I mean, the argument, and this is an argument made by Asimoglu and Robinson, I mean, you had a series of events, some of them are far back in history. They kind of added up, you had the Magna Carta, you had a, a slightly more independent peasantry in the, in the 14th century when you had the Black Death, when a third or a half of Europe died. Um, you know, the, the, the English yeomanry were use, able to use the resources that they had to become more independent, more wealthy. If you look at Eastern Europe, you got a reinforcement of serfdom, labor became more valuable, and the nobility simply cracked down on itself, on serfs. Uh, if you look at the, I think, and I really think this is critical, it's 17th century in Britain. Well, they cut off the king's head in 1849. If you were a king, 
You learned from that, I'm sure, that your head could be cut off. They brought in the Cromwell first of father, and then it said that didn't work out very well. Um, that, that was Parliament, so Parliament thought you probably needed a king. They brought back the Stuarts. Then they threw out the Stuarts in 1688. So you got some balance in the 17th century between Parliament and the king in England. Uh, the king was constrained, but Parliament also recognized that they needed some kind of sovereign. Um, if you think about what's happened in Britain, subsequently, if you any of you have seen the movie Dunkirk, it's true that the English were able to get their 250 or 350 troops off of the continent of Europe before the Second World War. It was a, yeah, but they did that by getting all kinds of small ships to bring back troops. If the weather had been bad or if there had been a storm, the Germans would have wiped out the British expeditionary force, uh, World War II. I'm not sure the outcome would have been different, but it certainly would have been a very different war. Um, if you look at modernization theory, I mean, the problem is that, as I said, there were some big flaws in the theories that countries don't necessarily become democratic when they become wealthier. And it can't explain why growth has begun in the first place. So there have been many parts of the world we had high tech levels of technology. Europe um, during the Roman Empire, certainly during the Greek period, um, the Mayas, even um, the Chinese Empire, which was in terms of technology ahead of Europe until about 1800. Um, it didn't necessarily mean that you would have high levels of economic growth. So given technology and, and advances in technology is no guarantee that economic growth will take place. Um, if you look at institutional capacity, I mean, the question is always, if you become a strong man, why don't you try to hold on to it? Why don't you become a Stalin or even a Hitler? You're not, once you get power, you're not going to give up power. And if you look at rational choice institutionalism, and the problem is it doesn't explain very well why you get this strong from closed access orders to open access orders, it posits a world which is either closed or open, which we don't think is the case. It's much more in continuity. Um, and it doesn't explain why this jump action takes place. It does rely on luck, but it doesn't have a systematic argument for why the jump to democracy and high levels of income take place. So if we look, I think we have a set of, of aims, and you saw this expressed very well by Admiral Fowler. We want gov good governance. We want elections. We want and anti-corruption, we want democracy. But these aims are very problematic if you're thinking about what crack rulers. I mean, they could be thrown out by free and fair elections. They, they get their money through corruption. Um, they don't want democracy. They want some of the corruption. And I was thinking as I, as I was listening to Admiral Fowler, I mean, after all, if you look at Central America or South America, these countries have not been great. They've been up against you know, the United States for a long period of time. We haven't figured out how to make these countries perfect democracies. So I think the basic argument here is that the OECD world is not the natural order of things. A few countries have made it, most countries have not. Um, so I think a key to success is you have to find local elites that you can work with. So I think MacArthur made some bad mistakes but if you're thinking about um, MacArthur, who was the ruler of Japan, you know, we could have tried the emperor as a war criminal. We did not. Um, I think MacArthur allied with the emperor Hirohito. He brought the Japanese elite into the side of the United States. The Japanese elite were very afraid of leftist developments in Japan. You had an alliance, and you eventually evolved into a country that's both democratic and wealthy. If you look at, at this, this Bush and Maliki, uh, the second picture I have here is of some, they gave a press conference together and someone threw a shoe at the president of the United States, an ultimate insult in the Arab world. So I think what we should aim for is good enough governance. We should think about security first. We might not always be able to get it in some neat way. Um, and you sort of see this in Afghanistan. We spent billions of dollars of treasure. We've lost thousands of people. We haven't gotten anything like democracy, and the country could be no better than it was before. 
And the best thing we may be able to hope for in, the, in Afghanistan is to keep a strong force offshore. And if we do actually get a revival of actions by the Taliban or others that are threat to our own security, we might be able to engage effectively in external violence, and that's the best we can get. I think it's better if you could get some centralized security forces that are effective, uh, which I think is something that actually happened in Colombia, but it doesn't necessarily mean that you have consolidated democracy. So I think we should aim for security. Uh, we should aim for better health. So improvements in health have really been the big success story since the Second World War. Life expectancy has increased by 30 years around the world. Most kids live, they don't die. If you went back 200 years, life expectancy was much shorter and most children died. So security, health, and if possible, some level of economic growth, but you're not going to be able to get economic growth that threatens autocratic leaders. So you're going to have to tolerate some level of revenge seeking. You will have to tolerate some level of corruption. Ideally, not corruption, which was piles of money out of the country. And that's it. So I think what we should get in our minds is that we're not, not everybody's going to be democratic and wealthy. There's no natural evolution towards high levels of democracy and high levels of wealth. We have to ally with local elites. Some of those may be good, some may be not so good. If we can find local elites that are tolerable, we should ally with them and we should hope, and I think this is something we have to defend on developments in specific countries, that they will ultimately evolve into democracy and welfare, which is what happened in Japan, but there's no guarantee that that will happen, which is what we're seeing in China. Okay, our next speaker, I think, will there were some specifics. That's the 50,000 foot for you. Thank you. Thank you, Steve. I, I, I think I'm, I'm next up. Um, let me join Ambassador Eikenberry in thanking AAAS and, and uh, the Marine Corps University for giving us this chance to, to be part of this panel today. We're going to be shifting topics a bit, but I, I think you'll you'll see some connections between um, Professor Krasner's presentation and what I'm about to say. Uh, with respect to the really severe difficulties we encounter in cultivating effective governance, and, and in particular in, in states that are in conflict or emerging from, from conflict. And, and what I'd really like to use my, my time today to do is to make a, a pretty straightforward case, but, but a case that I hope will be at least a little bit provocative and generate some questions for rethinking in pretty fundamental ways how we understand the impact of conflict on the political economies of conflict-affected states and, and to explore you know, pretty briefly what this rethinking might mean for how we approach the challenges of post-war reconstruction. I, I make this argument pretty simply because I think the assumptions that tend to drive current approaches, current interventions, current practices in the field of post-conflict reconstruction are anchored in what I see as deeply flawed understandings about how conflicts like the ones that are still unfolding across the MENA region, conflicts in, in Libya and Syria in Yemen, uh, affect local economies, affect local political economies, but also about the potential for economic reconstruction to serve as the instrument, not only of, of rebuilding a country physically, but as a mechanism that's often used to achieve very, very fundamental reform of, of economic governance, of economic institutions, of economic practices. So what do I mean by, by flawed understandings and, and assumptions? There are really, I think, three main assumptions that drive current practice um, that I argue are in need of serious rethinking. The first is the assumption that war causes a rupture, a really sharp rupture, between pre-war political economies and wartime economies. Even if we accept that conflicts tend to occur in countries where economic governance is already quite poor, we tend to think that conflict disrupts pre-war economies and creates something sui generis, something distinctive to a wartime situation.
and and what I've put up here is a slide uh, with uh, an excerpt from a pretty well-known book on the topic that emphasizes this view that conflict causes a sharp rupture in economies, in economic behavior, in economic practices. We 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 tend to think that conflict destroys pre-war institutions and gives rise to something that might be called a wartime economic order, which is, which is as the slide shows, parasitic, predatory, corrupt, personalistic, uh, and where rule of law is weak or, or, or non-existent. The second assumption that I think is problematic is that if we want to exit conflict economies, to do that requires creating norms and institutions that are going to avoid reproducing the conditions that drove an economy, drove a country into conflict uh, in the first place. Now, that's not necessarily wrong, but it's widely believed that because conflict destroys pre-war institutions and governance, the way to do this is by exploiting the opportunity that conflict creates to reform state institutions, to strengthen the quality of economic governance, to create something other than the good enough governance that Professor Krasner focused on. So the pathway out of conflict economies is seen as requiring reform of the state where prospects for reform are seen as higher post-conflict because of the destructive effects of conflict on pre-war institutions. And again, in this slide, I've highlighted some arguments to this effect that are pretty easy to come across in the literature on this topic. Next slide. And the third assumption is that these projects of state reform after conflict have a lot of local support, that they have significant reform constituencies. Because conflict is so destructive, it builds popular support for, pros for projects of, uh, of economic reform. It, give, it, it gives rise to stakeholders who are expected to help drive and sustain programs of, of institutional reform. And it's these three assumptions that conflict causes a, a rupture in, in pre-war economies, that, that exiting a conflict requires programs of state institutional reform uh, to avoid a recurrence of conflict, and that these projects of reform have local constituencies that have been enormously influential in shaping how post-conflict interventions tend to be structured. However, if we look at conflicts in the MENA region and, and probably beyond as well, but if we focus on the conflicts in Syria and Libya and Yemen, what we learn is that all three of these assumptions are deeply, deeply problematic and that we need to think really in very, very different ways if our aim is to improve the economic conditions of people living in post-conflict settings. How are these assumptions problematic then? Let me just take a minute to highlight that. First, what we see in the conflicts that are unfolding in MENA is that wartime economic orders, or what are called wartime economic orders in these three countries, Syria, Libya, and Yemen, really reflect a very high level of continuity with pre-war political economies. Uh, basically, in all three of these countries, pre-war economies were defined by precisely the same attributes that were associated specifically with wartime economic orders in the slide that I showed earlier. They were predatory, they were corrupt, they were personalistic, rule of law was very weak, and in fact, rather than disrupt these norms and practices, what we see in these conflicts is that they tend to be reinforced, they tend to be deepened and amplified. And this continuity, I think, makes it really problematic to define exiting conflict economies as a process of restoring what is often referred to as economic normalcy, when what was normal in these countries is in direct conflict with the goals of most practitioners whose ambitions might extend beyond good enough governance. Second, in, in all three of these cases, we see that local political elites, pre-war elites, are incredibly capable of resisting and capturing projects of post-conflict institutional reform. They exploit external interventions, uh, as a means to legitimate themselves. That's absolutely explicit in the Syrian case. 
They exploit external interventions to further consolidate their hold on power. Again, incredibly uh, evident in the Syrian case. So what we find is that the bias of international actors who prefer to use state-based models in supporting projects of post-conflict reconstruction who rely on state actors as the principal agents of reconstruction tend to empower and legitimate state authorities that operate with very, very powerful incentives. Uh, on the one hand, of course, to get as much reconstruction funding as, as they can, who wouldn't want that, but also to operate uh, uh, in ways that are intended to exploit reconstruction funding to sustain and empower themselves, to sustain the corrupt predatory ruling coalitions that dominate states and political economies. And of course, this is all the more likely to be the case in those conflicts in which um, the, the incumbents, the, the targets of an insurgency, the targets of challenges to, to state rule or, or, or to a regime, um, uh, are the ones who prevail in a conflict, which is likely to, which has essentially happened in Syria, or where a conflict brings a new set of corrupt predatory rulers to power, which seems to be the most likely outcome that we'll encounter uh, in both Yemen and in Libya. So third, rather than creating powerful constituencies that support projects of state reform, we also see, if we look at what's happening in the MENA region, that conflicts have instead expanded constituencies with an interest in preserving existing economic frameworks. The most powerful of these are often themselves ruling elites or have close ties to ruling elites. So the idea that there are these constituencies for reform that are able to serve as advocates of, of projects of fundamental institutional change turns out to be uh, to, to be not the case when we look at these conflicts in the region. So it, those are the, the three driving assumptions I wanted to focus on and why I think they're problematic. But if, if what we think of today as best practice doesn't work, what do we do? What are the, the alternatives? And what I'd argue is that we need to think about how to develop new models of post-conflict reconstruction. And what I'd propose is that we build these models around four very simple starting points. And I've written about these in terms of reconstruction in Syria. Go small. I think it's really important to scale interventions on a level that local communities can absorb effectively. Uh, and to resist pleas from governments in conflict-affected states for levels of reconstruction funding that will almost inevitably lead to, uh, to waste, to corruption, uh, to abuse. Second, go local. This is hardly a new priority in the development field or in the post-conflict field, but we still find, I think, that reconstruction planning tends to be driven much more by top-down centralized planning processes than by what matters to uh, communities affected by conflict. Third is go slow. Um, if we recognize that rebuilding local economies is going to be a long-term process, needs to happen through the capacities at local levels, then it's going to take time to uh, carry out effectively. And we're more likely to see success in those efforts if local timetables shape how these programs play out than if they're driven by the burn rate of the beltway contractors, uh, which are often the principal actors in, in uh, shaping the, the timing of post-conflict interventions. Now, the fourth go around the state, I, I think this in some ways is the most important starting point for new models of post-conflict reconstruction, but it's also the most controversial and perhaps the most difficult to implement. The reality is that the global architecture, if you can call it that, of post-conflict reconstruction is state-based. It, it works through state uh, state uh, government, it works through governments, it works through state-based institutions like the United Nations, like the World Bank. And those institutions, those governments, find it challenging to work beyond the state. But under conditions like those, certainly in Syria, I, I think we will also see them emerge in Libya and Yemen. 
where the state becomes the principal threat to human security, where states are corrupt, where states are predatory, I think what we really need to foster is a capacity on the part of state actors to circumvent states in conflict affected areas in order to build more effective models of post-conflict reconstruction. And I'll stop with that, except to point out that I think, as I said, you can see some connections here in these recommendations between what I'm suggesting and what Professor Krasner suggested, that if we avoid the temptation to imagine that we are going to transform post-conflict countries into high-functioning democracies through the instrument of post-conflict reconstruction, we may find that we're actually able to do a lot more good than we might otherwise. Thank you. Great. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Berry should be up next. Thank you very much. And um, both Stephen and Steve, thank you for your presentations. Uh, I'm going to talk to you a little bit about conflict and pandemics um, and how um, some of the issues of how pandemics ignore borders and question state sovereignty and governance. And again, an epidemic, just for a definition, an, a pandemic is a disease that spreads over several countries or continents, and it really does ignore um, governance and sovereignty. Let's see if I can get to the next slide. Um, so and pandemics emerge when we have oops, altered, altered ecology, where you have human and animal. Well, first, let me go back. These are. Uh, Sorry, let me just go back to so just to remind you of what some of the issues with um, what where you need shared global governance um, and what I would call other pandemics is around air pollution, climate change, as well as pandemic infectious diseases. Um, these are all issues which need uh, shared global governance. And when we think of pandemic infectious disease, the majority of these emerging infectious diseases have been zoonoses, infections transmitted between humans and animals, and uh, as these pictures delineate, are close contact with each. They emerge when we have altered ecology, where we have spillover from animals with human and animal contact. Um, globalization enhances the risks of pandemics. And then brings me to why um, Stephen and, and Carl eventually asked me to talk about this, is that really hot spots for emerging diseases are often hot spots for civil conflict. Um, and I have the pleasure of writing with Paul Wise at an issue, at a piece in Daedalus discussing this. And where we see conflict and emergence disease, we really see lack of good glo gov global governance or good actually national governance, where you see interruption of immunizations, absent biosurveillance of animal illnesses, disrupted health education, food insecurity, where people are forced into the bush or into the forest to hunt wildlife and have increased exposure um, to the animals like bats that cause zoonoses and spillover. Um, we see lowered immunity when you see food insecurity. Um, in conflict, you also have migration to remote forested areas where, again, you have more animal contact. We have erratic antibiotic use because you can't get antibiotics so that you have increased another pandemic of increased antimicrobial resistance. When you have large refugee camps, it obviously leads to crowding and amplification of disease with poor sanitation and water contamination occurring because of the infrastructure difficulties. This is a nice map, I think, of showing case studies of conflict and emerging diseases, where a majority of our diseases, such as loss of fever, yellow fever, malaria, um, things like Ebola, have emerged in areas of conflicting, uh, in areas of conflict. Um, just to a case study, in 2014, for two years, we saw an unprecedented two-year outbreak of 28,000 cases and 11,000 deaths of Ebola. And the epicenter of this outbreak, which eventually spread, um, fortunately, not as large as our pandemic now, but we, we saw this as a collapse in infrastructure around three countries that had really had 
uh, really had post-conflict settings, all of which had tremendous limited health care. Guinea had a 2009 coup d'etat, which left them with eight physicians per 100,000 population. Sierra Leone had a civil war, which left them for two physicians per 100,000. And Liberia, where I work, um, really we were working with essentially two physicians per 100,000 population. So you can imagine how that um, really puts you in a position for having epidemic and potentially pandemic disease. And most recently, we've had the second largest outbreak in history, again in a country with conflict, the DRC, um, where we saw this as a hot spot for emerging violence and armed militants attacking Ebola treatment units. And again, um, there was quite a lot of uh, risk of transmission, and we saw it a little bit at the borders of neighboring countries with potential for political destabilization um, and economic uh, de devastation. Now, what are some of the unique challenges and perhaps epidemics, uh, opportunities in these epidemics? Well, the challenge is when you're in a conflict, it's very slow to let people know what's happening and for the WHO to call a public health emergency. Um, there is tremendous mistrust of vaccines and treatment, not necessarily only aligned to areas of conflict, but I think exacerbated in that. You see delays in elections um, and you see um, great difficulty in setting up centralized Ebola treatment units during conflict because it's very important to get people into care quickly and isolate them in quarantine. Now, we did see some opportunities in this kind of epidemic because we were able to test uh, very effective new vaccines, which really um, set the stage for uh, COVID-19 vaccines with new therapeutics, such as monoclonals, which um, dramatically reduced the fatalities in Ebola. Um, I think um, Dr. Hayman talked about, Yem uh, about Yemen and what's happening there. And what we're seeing there is also an absolute humanitarian crisis with cholera. Um, the ongoing civil war has destroyed water, sanitation, and health infrastructure. And there, this has really sort of fallen off the radar screen, but there are now over 2 million uh, cholera cases, and it continues to be um, a large um, issue. Um, cholera is a preventable, diseases, a preventable disease with water and sanitation and vaccine, if you can get vaccine to the folks. Um, so conflict prevents this international aid infrastructure repair and vaccination. This is a very interesting study done by one of my colleagues, Iran Ben David, um, which looked at um, the deaths of children under five um, between due to conflict. And it was a really interesting study that measured um, what happened if the child survived the first five years of life. And if you were born near an acute or chronic conflict, um, you could show that there was a tremendous amount of stunting and neonatal mortality due to malnutrition and infectious diseases. And they were able to actually look at the kilometers away from um, an area of conflict and showed that even up to greater than 75 kilometers, you're still seeing this increased risk of stunting and malnutrition uh, due to the conflict. And what exacerbates this is even the attacks on healthcare workers. Um, and this is just in the last six months, uh, the targeting of, uh, healthcare workers and hospitals um, in the areas with um, civil conflict. And you can see that there are attacks, deaths, and injuries um, on, in particularly 14 hotspots, um, which really prevents my colleagues in Medicine Sans Frontier, particularly in giving care. Now, I want to sort of switch, because originally in my article, we, did, we talked mostly about Ebola, because that was the pandemic happening there. But I think it's important to think about COVID-19 and conflict and what happens in conflict areas when COVID hits them. Well, uh, the obvious is shortage in conflict settings of ventilators, protection equipment, trained healthcare workers, infrastructure, and vaccines. And on the right-hand side, there's a little box which just shows you um, the, the absolute crisis in getting ventilators or oxygen in conflict settings. Um, and in Northwest Syria, forget it. It's, you know, they have no hospital beds, um, intensive care units, or doctors. Um, in occupied Palestinian, just a um, contrast, occupied Palestinian territory with Israel, 
Um, again, when you're in refugee camps, there's a lack of tremendous social distancing. There's a lack of wash, water and sanitation, what we call wash services. Um, in the Gaza Strip, 96% scarce water is not safe for human com consumption, and you can't wash your hands uh, for COVID. You get fragmented and under-resourced health systems, and you get a lack of access to vaccines. In the Palestinian territories, only 10% have been vaccinated compared to Israel, where 64% have been, and which abuts, obviously, the territory. Only 64% have been vaccinated. I think this is a really interesting um, uh, flow chart of, that done by the Mercy Corps of looking at what are some of the issues with COVID-19 and conflict pathways. And I don't think, I don't, can you see my, my marker? I don't know whether they can see my marker, but if you yeah, look at Yeah, we can COVID, see it. Okay, COVID-19 uh, lockdowns or restrictions. What happens is you get reduced social interactions, you get reduced social cohesion, and then you get communal conflict. Um, you get obviously weakened social organization as well, which often sometimes adds to increased organized criminal conflict. Um, you get economic hardship, crime insecurity. Um, the, there's a nice study, which I took the slide out that looked at what's happening in Nigeria um, since COVID has started and they have 62% more um, armed incidents um, homicides and violence. Um, when you have COVID-19 relief, which you think would be great, you know, vaccines are finally getting, although only less than 2% of the Africa continent now has vaccinated, but there is COVID-19 relief coming out with vaccines. And what you see is corruption. You see there was a big scandal in Peru where all the ministers of health and, and the elite um, got vaccinated. Um, when you have this mistrust of government, you get anti-state government conflict, armed group recruitment, less government um, um, presence. And again, um, leading to the three things, organized criminal conflict, um, community conflict, and anti-state conflict. So I think this is really kind of interesting because you would think that lockdown and relief would help, but you can see how they can exacerbate in the setting of conflict settings. So what are some of the solutions that sort of splayed out some of the problems? Well, some of the solutions, again, um, with what my prior speakers talked about is strong governance issues. When you have po weak political legitimacy, you undermine public health initiatives. Um, you basically saw in, in Liberia that there was a real problem, even though I'm a very big fond, I'm very fond of Ellen, Ellen Zarif Johnson, who was the head then, um, it was very hard for her um, to work in areas of poverty and strengthen the legitimacy of her government. Um, there are economic disincentives, disincentives to report on infectious diseases. We saw with the first SARS outbreak, SARS-CoV-1, it took China about four months before they reported it to the WHO. Um, we did, um, I don't like to think of it in shame and blame, but we did um, give incentives um, moral incentives to have them actually report earlier. And it only took them a couple of weeks to get the uh, WHO alerted to the outbreak and, and also handing over the genome that they had worked on. So we need to strengthen these incentives for reporting and ramifications for silence. I think we have to think of how we're gonna vaccinate in times of conflict, because it's not only getting COVID vaccine in areas of conflict, but when you look at who the, the child vaccinations that happen during conflict, you see tremendous amount of lack of the regular measles, mumps, Bella, and polio vaccination um, during times of conflict. So this is a very interesting, I thought, um, um, article in JID, which talked about some strategies, how we can vaccinate within conflicts. Um, we can have negotiated timeouts to vaccinate. Um, we've seen that happen. Uh, hit and run during days of ceasefire. We can have barrier vaccination zones where we essentially, this is what we did in smallpox, where you do ring vaccinations uh, around an area of conflict and hoping that that will prevent um, spillover. We can do military embedding for vaccination. And this becomes very controversial um, because uh, most of my colleagues like Medicine Sans Frontier who are doing the vaccinations are, they try to remain politically neutral. We could have local vaccination uh, community teams, such as the White Helmets in Syria. We can vaccinate during border crossings. 
and we can vaccinate in refugee camps. So I think some of the solutions clearly are to strengthen this healthcare infrastructure. We really have a really lacking a strong WHO, World Health Organization. Uh, their budget in 220 was two, really 2.4 billion. Uh, Stanford Healthcare System, where I work, has an annual budget of 6.8 billion. So you can imagine the contrast. We want this health organization for the world uh, to function on 2.4 billion, and a lot of that is earmarked um, for um, country use. And then we need an epidemic pandemics threats program. Um, and I'll talk to you a little bit about what I've been involved in to help that. Um, shared global governance, because we're not going to tackle pandemics without having um, interaction and um, interdigitation between state players and nation players. Um, and then I am really a big proponent of what I call One Health or Planetary Health. And it's the concept that we cannot have healthy people, we cannot eliminate pandemics unless we start looking at our one health of animals and humans, and we cannot have healthy humans without having a healthy planet. Um, so we're starting at Stanford a, a One Health Planetary Health Movement. So talking, um, ending on some of the shared governance um, uh, agendas that have come up after these pandemics is the Global Health Security Agenda, where over 65 nations have participated since 2014, and they set targets for countries to build capacity to prevent and detect infectious diseases. Um, the 2024 target is to get, and this is sort of a buddy system where one country pairs up with another country and helps build capacity for surveillance of their animals and surveillance of diseases that occur. The WHO, as much as we say, how weak it, can, it is, and there's been a lot of criticism about it. They did a damn good job with COVID-19. Um, they procured um, protective um, goggles, gowns, face shields to 135 countries. And, you know, we're talking about millions of gloves and respirators. They ran solidarity trials, which basically 100 countries, when you're doing these large clinical studies, you need to have large amounts of patients enrolled. And they were able to do these trials together. Um, the partners platform where they onboarded many of the low income countries um, to really get checklists and figure out how to approach COVID-19 with national plans. Um, again, they strengthened laboratory treatment and biomedical um, equipment. Um, they developed R&D and I'll talk to you a little bit about COVAX, um, where they not only help develop vaccines, tests and treatments, but they actually helped to disseminate vaccines, not so well yet, um, but they did develop with Gavi and CEPI a mechanism called COVAX to get vaccines to low income countries. And they, they deployed experts, although they, they really have very few experts that they can deploy. And we can talk about that in another um, slide perhaps. Um, COVAX, I do wanna share, it was a, a really, I thought, um, very um, forethink, forward thinking um, attempt at shared global governance for vaccines. It was a coalition of WHO, the Global Alliance for Vaccine Initiative, the Coalition for Ep Epidemic uh, Pandemics and UNICEF to distribute COVID-19 e equitably. And the goal was to subsidize cost of vaccines for 20% of LICs um, and having high income countries pay into this. Unfortunately, there have been a lot of pledges, but not a lot of money coming forward, and COVAX has been responsible uh, for less than 4% of the 2 billion vaccines doses administered worldwide. Again, um, some of the challenges besides not having the money are poor health infrastructure and conflict settings. Um, so I just want to remind you that, that that plays a huge role. And then I've been involved um, with, there, there will be, if anyone's interested on August 5th, there's a National Academy of Medicine report um, that Victor Zhao and Larry Summers um, brought out. It's a G20 high level independent panel on financing pandemic preparedness with really talking about how COVID-19 is not, it's not a black swan event. This is gonna happen again. Uh, many of us you know, stay up at nights thinking about um, a much more potentially deadlier and fatal disease than COVID-19. And this report really came out saying that we have to commit at least 75 billion over the next five years um, to start a global health threats board. 
um, that would actually have health and finance ministers from the G20 with a financial commitment to surveillance and research and medical countermeasures and tools to shorten the response time um, and develop vaccines, drugs, and therapeutics equitably with access. So I'll end with a statement by um, a, um, a person that sort of has a, a he's kind of a character in uh, the California, Larry Brilliant, where he said, epidemics are inevitable, but pandemics are optional. And I hope I've shared some of the things that might help in making them optional. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Dr. Barry. And then uh, so I'll turn it back to Ambassador Eikenberry. I think you uh, had some comments to wrap it up, sir. Yeah, great. Thanks, Ian. Thanks to uh, colleagues. So, uh, Steve, I thought laid out our occasional paper uh, very well. And uh, using these expressions such as uh, the American notion, at least, that uh, when we talk about the world of uh, development, that all good things come together, that uh, you can advance towards uh, liberal political uh, democracy, uh, have economic development, more inclusion within society. But as we know, and I think Steve articulated well, that all things, uh, uh, good things do not come together necessarily. So this theme of modesty and humility uh, in terms of what kind of policies uh, do you enact then, what kind of strategies do you develop to uh, deal with countries and try to help countries that are inflicted with interstate violence uh, and the need for prioritization of effort. And I think that the three presentations that we had where Steve talked about uh, limited political objectives, limited development objectives, uh, Stephen uh, talked about limited economic objectives. And uh, Michelle, I thought you were uh, excellent in not necessarily talking about limited health objectives, but this issue of focus. Uh, you've got so many resources available. You have to uh, look at what are the threats that you're really facing and what are you going to do to uh, prioritize? And if you're dealing with a uh, country uh, that uh, where the threat of uh, pandemics emerging is severe, then perhaps much of what uh, Michelle had uh, laid out is something of interest to policy uh, makers. So three very brief uh, policy implications then the first is that now speaking from an American perspective and a personal perspective, but I know many that are watching and will be watching this would share this view that our efforts in Iraq and Afghanistan in the 21st century, it was the industrial strength counterinsurgency strategy that uh, was applied. Getting back to what Steve had talked about, modesty and uh, humility. Uh, the effort was, uh, let's say they were overly ambitious. But the risk that I think we have now as a nation is that uh, you can walk away from those experiences and then conclude that nothing works in this world. And so uh, let's do nothing. And trying to find that middle ground in terms of doctrine, uh, strategy, what kind of capabilities do we need? The second is, and this I think is particularly uh, aimed at military leaders, that uh, we will find ourselves, uh, whether uh, in a distant land or whether uh, perhaps more likely in uh, our own hemisphere in the years ahead, we'll be faced with some very severe challenges with countries that are afflicted with civil war and are breaking down and all kinds of threats that emerge. And then the question becomes, about what should be the strategy that's applied and uh, does the military have a role? And here's the cautionary note for the military, that the military when called in, it has tremendous convening power, great organizational capacity. It has resources. And once the military goes in, all of us know that in the White House and Congress, that uh, they tend to, that point to want to listen to what military leaders have to say. I remember as ambassador in Afghanistan that uh, many meetings, uh, which were going back to the White House Situation Room, and the military commanders uh, in the field, they, uh, as they spoke and had many PowerPoint slides, people were listening intensely. Uh, when it came to me and I talked about uh, how we were doing in terms of uh, building uh, schools and roads 
there wasn't uh, there wasn't the uh, keen interest uh, at that point. So the the cautionary note then to the military is given the position that the military occupies and the status it enjoys and the resources once the decision is made to send in the forces, uh, the need to, let's say, give politically informed military advice. And here I don't mean politically informed about how's the president going to do in the next election based upon the military campaign. But I do mean that when military leaders then are asked for advice about a strategy, thinking through uh, when they uh, present a plan that says, here's our military campaign plan, and this will all work provided that the civilian side provides 5,000 experts for the next 20 years uh, in this country, then we have a fighting chance. Uh, the military will, will not uh, make that point. We'll say, well, if we have an assumption this is going to occur. And when we look at the campaigns that uh, have been fought over the last uh, several decades, I think we could look back and say that military leaders were not fully responsible then when those debates were taking place to make very clear to our political leadership that we can do certain military things on the ground, but it's entirely problematic beyond that. And to have more candid conversations with civilian counterparts in the Department of State and USAID and so forth. Third and final point is with regard to the building of security forces, and Steve touched upon this. Uh, it, it, the American model for building security forces is we try to build security forces uh, in, in our own manner, in, uh, as a reflection of who we are. And we make modifications for, uh, in terms of the equipment that they'll have, the technologies that will be made available to them based upon uh, realistic assessments of what is suitable for that country. But many starting points here are also that we're going to build security forces that are apolitical and they're going to uh, be fully accountable to the political authorities. They will be fully transparent. And as Steve had indicated, the building of security forces is a profoundly political enterprise. That's the starting point, the politics behind it. And uh, for the U.S., when we have our security assistance building programs, I don't think we have a good recognition of this. It's an assumption that we will be able to compartmentalize this effort and we'll be able to develop an apolitical security force. And that just will not occur. I think a good starting point then for the military and for civilian leadership is actually to look not only at many failed experiments about building security forces in our own image, but look at the other side, look at the non-state actors, look at the guerrilla forces, the insurgent forces, and what has been key to their success. And there's a very interesting book that uh, Steve Biddle has uh, written recently called Non-State Actors. And he talks about the influence of technologies on the battlefield, but he makes a compelling case about how political institutions for the non-state actors and a recognition, a collective recognition about how much of an existential threat are the stakes involved that can help inform then in turn, how do we go about building security forces on the state side? I'll stop there. All right, thank you very much, Ambassador. And uh, so to the audience, as I said in the chat, you can go ahead and answer, or enter your questions in the chat and I will bring them up to the panel here. But I do have a couple of, uh, of items I wrote down that I'll, I'll offer to start off the conversation with the panel. Um, and uh, so the first one um, kind of jumps off Professor Hademan's presentation. Um, you know, going, looking at those sort of four, four different avenues in which you can try and have a new model for visualizing more successful reconstruction. And um, I was wondering if, you know, did you, are there any recent examples of, of something in a polite summer, all of these successful lines of effort as a model. And I, I mean, recent, you know, you know, in the last few decades, not necessarily the last few years per se. Um, and if the U S does not have a recent model that can necessarily draw from, are there any, any examples you can think of, of other nations doing their own, um, you know, interventions in their, in their region, 
where they did successfully pursue one or all of those lines of effort. Yeah, thank you, Ian. That that's a really important question, and and I can think of of a couple of examples in particular. Um, most of both of which draw from the the work that I've done over the years, focusing on the Syria conflict. One of the principal successes I think that we've seen has to do with the use of stabilization funding in in in, in eastern Syria and in uh, in in the Deir Ezzor area and and Raqqa south of there to provide communities with the equipment that they need to install uh, solar panels for power generation. I think anyone who follows the, the Middle East understands what a, what a toxic issue uh, power generation has become politically in Iraq and Lebanon and Syria. It's, it's, it's a massive concern. And governments have proven singularly unwilling or unable uh, to to resolve uh, some of the massive shortages in power generation that we've seen in those countries. And yet, when communities have opportunities to provide their own power supply through uh, through solar panels, um, they turn out to be very very willing to do so. These are very small investments. Their investments that equip these communities with the opportunity to run schools, to run medical clinics, uh, to to uh, refrigerate pharmaceutical, uh, uh, you know, medicines that are needed locally, and they 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 operate in ways that that to some extent insulate these communities from the more predatory impulses of regimes that often will pursue projects of reconstructing power supplies and electricity grids uh, in part at least along political grounds um, and and so you have this this very modest very small scale locally driven kind of an effort that turns out to make enormous improvements in the everyday lives of some of these communities uh, another would be in in the northwest in the days when we were still providing reconstruction support there in which we worked with small-scale agriculturalists to develop cooperatives that permitted them to coordinate their capabilities in order to maximize the productivity of of their of their farms. Whether typically this was in the areas of olive production, but but there are other examples as well. And so what we find is that when we build sort of local capacity to coordinate, to manage, to implement small scale economic projects, these can have really significant effects. They do it in ways that make it all the more difficult for central authorities to come in and disrupt and extract or exploit resources from these communities. And I think they can become very powerful tools. There are always questions about how to ramp something like that up to scale. How do you do that on a national basis? And the reality is that it's very hard. If we're working locally, if we're working in a decentralized fashion, then I think one of the realities that we need to accept is that we're going to have to invest very, very heavily in the capacity to pursue um, a spectrum of the smaller localized interventions uh, in ways that may be more labor intensive from the perspective of, of, of the donors who are funding these efforts, but which are far more likely to have effective results in the long run. Great, thank you. Uh, do any of the other panelists have any comments or thoughts on that? Professor Krasner, go ahead. Yeah, so just let me say, I mean, it's, and I don't think Stephen would disagree with this, it is challenging because you you have to find local actors to work with that means you have to understand the local situation, which often we do not. Um, and I think, and this is simply underlying something that Stephen has already said, you have to find local actors who see it as being in their interest to align with your objectives. All right, thank you. Ambassador, go ahead. Yeah, just to uh, uh, give an example then of what uh, Steve was talking about, understanding the local context. It, it's, it is extraordinarily difficult in you know, this, this problem of information asymmetry. Uh, to give one specific example, though, uh, during the height of the surge in Afghanistan, as the ambassador, I flew down to uh, Argandab district in uh, Kandahar. And a, <clears throat> the US Army had committed a, a striker infantry a battalion to uh, clearing this district out of the Taliban. And uh, some really tough fighting took place. Uh, 
And then we immediately followed up with uh, a big reinforcement of uh, spending from USAID. We had agricultural experts from the Department of Agriculture that uh, were down in the area. When I went down, uh, I, I saw that there was uh, there was some uh, good work going on. Cash for work was a big thing. I asked the question, "What did we know about the uh, the political economy?" And the answer was, "Well, not a lot, and that to be understood, it, the fighting had just uh, ended." When I went back a couple of months later, because I I said I'd really like to come back and learn a little bit more, then the uh, the insights that the team had gotten by that time on the ground was that the land was really owned by absentee landlords who were sitting in Kabul. A lot of them were in Dubai, a lot of them were in Europe. And the resentment of the uh, farmers on the ground, the tenants on the farm was huge. In fact, the cash for work program that we started up, a lot of migrant laborers came, uh, came in. And so as we looked at the crops growing and having a sense initially that this was all good, indeed, we were making conditions worse. All right, thank you. Okay, uh, we have a couple questions in the chat here that I want to make sure we get to. And uh, first one is directed at Dr. Barry from Ariel Aram and asking, what can the global health community do to improve capacities of non-state actors to provide public health in places that are outside the control of central governments, such as in the DRC, parts of Yemen and northern Syria? Um. I think probably the be the best way to do it is by working with neutral partners such as Medicine Sans Frontier, um, who go in as a neutral partner and actually um, deliver vaccines and healthcare. Um, for the military, um, the question is, what can the military do? There have been some embedding of um, military folks to help vaccinate and give health care. Again, that has to have buy-in um, from the local folks on the ground. Okay, thank you. Yeah. The, is, that the, more the the global was, health, is it more the global health community, what they can do? Yeah, it, it was a broader, I was, you know, certainly military has a role, but also, what, you know, in that global health community you touched on. Yeah, no, I actually think that the global health community has a larger role than the military because the military is sort of a, uh, a red button um, kind of thing. So I do think non, the global health community in particular, Medicine Frontier, and since I am the chair of the Board of Universities doing global health, I think that each of our universities can step to the plate to do healthcare capacity building um, at the local hospital settings. Okay, thank you. Uh, anyone else on the panel have any um, additional comments on that question? Ambassador, go ahead. Uh, yeah, uh, Michelle, just a question for colleague here. And Michelle, when you, uh, this challenge that you have of trying to uh, push uh, healthcare into uh, conflict zones, uh, is that something that the the healthcare your your healthcare NGOs are equipped to do in terms of the negotiations that need to take place uh, themselves, or does it require another set of experts to come in who are good at in terms of the, uh, the negotiations and trying to uh, broker the deals politically? Mm -hmm. You know, I think that's a great question, Carl, um, because what's usually been done is it's been at the local NGO level um, and there's not been a lot of collaboration by NGOs talking to each other. Um, I, I use Medicine Sans Frontier or Doctors Without Borders as a um, as as really an exam exemplar of being able to come in. And even them, even they have been attacked um, um, by local players and non-governmental players. So. It would be good, and I, you know, I'm hoping if this global threats board of the G20 comes together, um, that there would be a mechanism for better negotiation for neutral neutral health groups to come in. But right now, I do think that there is not great coordination between NGOs, and that's a great idea. And I wonder if the other panelists have other input on how that could be initiated. Steve? Well, the only thing I want to say is I think that the advantage of vaccinations is there, one shot, and they don't require institutional change. 
I think as soon as you move towards institutional change, building more robust healthcare systems, it, all I would say is it's just hard. It's very hard. Whereas the advantage of vaccinations, which is one of the things you emphasize, the advan you can do that without changing institutional structures. And also build confidence. Right. We see how hard it is even in the United States to do that. Right. All right. Thank you. Uh, Professor Heyman, do you have any comments on that? Otherwise, Not on this one, thanks, but perhaps on the next one. Okay. Yeah, great. Then we'll jump into the next question here from Tanner Bush. So this, uh, he is asking, concerning working with local elites to establish security in areas of conflict, how do we pursue relationships with elites if their actions are not politically palatable to members of Congress, the U.S. population, or our supporting allies? And additionally, how do we oppose adversary interference in those areas of conflict from actors that may not have the same moral standards or political challenges? So, Steve, if you want to go first. Sure. No, I'd be I'd be happy to to offer some thoughts on that. We have two very concrete examples of that in MENA conflicts. We have Northwest Syria, where the dominant political force is Hayat Tahrir al-Sham, with HTS, which is a designated terrorist organization uh, by the United States and the European Union. And we have Yemen, where the Houthis, Ansar Allah, um, is uh, the dominant political force in a big section of the country. Uh, where there's been a lot of contention around whether it's a terrorist organization or not, designated as such uh, in the very last moments of the Trump administration with that designation then reversed uh, in the Biden administration. And in both cases, we find very active uh, and again, very contentious debates underway about whether the character of these movements should influence policy concerning uh, engagement around questions of humanitarian aid delivery, uh, which is crucial for the stability of these regions. In, in Idlib, we have three and a half to four million people, most of whom are IDPs uh, living in conditions of, of, of real deprivation. And the argument by organizations like the International Crisis Group and others has been that we need to swallow hard, recognize that we have little in common with these organizations, but prioritize the health and well-being uh, of these innocent civilian communities um, and, and be prepared to engage in limited ways with HTS around uh, questions of humanitarianism. Doing so, of course, would extend legitimacy and would empower an actor very much of the type that I described in my presentation. And the same is true, I think, in the case of the Houthis in, in, in Yemen. What's so interesting is that the U.S. government has made the calculation, perhaps because of the health conditions in Yemen that we heard about in Dr. Barry's presentation, uh, to go ahead and, and um, extend you and continue humanitarian operations recognizing that the Houthis are, are an actor with which we would not normally engage, with which we, which we might otherwise uh, move forward to designate as a terrorist organization. So I, I think for me, the critical consideration, there, there are clearly a number of them, but one of them is what's at stake in a decision to engage with an actor like that. On one hand, and second, how much of this tolerance for the kinds of um, conduct that we find reprehensible? I mean, Steve Krasner mentioned we have to be prepared, prepared for a certain amount of rent seeking. We have to be prepared to work with people we might not necessarily find congenial. But are there limits to that? And, and how do we define those limits? What are they? Uh, I, I find the humanitarian considerations, frankly, to be pretty compelling uh, in these kinds of cases. But I think we have ways in which we can navigate our relationships with these actors that don't require that limited and, and tightly contained forms of engagement need become a slippery slope that will drive us toward full recognition, full engagement, acceptance, tolerance, legitimation. And so I, I think we need to look at what it is we're trying to do, what the stakes are, uh, who the actors are, their conduct, and, and arrive at, 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 a, at a decision really in some respects very much on a case-by-case -case basis. Right, thank you. Um, Professor Krasner, do you have any um, thoughts on that question? Uh, so I don't disagree with that, but I think what we need to do is think, 
Yeah, we're not aiming for eliminating corruption. We're aiming for containing corruption. We can aim for elections, but not elections that are going to overthrow an autocratic elite. So I think we have to basically tap down our objectives and think that we're, some of the guys we're going to get involved with are not such nice guys. And accept that, recognizing that we're not going to find any really nice guys. So this is only reinforcing what Steve has said, but it, it will require a change in mindset. It will require recognizing that we're not going to get full democracy, consolidated democracy, that the best we can hope for is some of them that is far below that, some level of corruption, elections, but not free and fair elections, some rule of law, but not rule of law that's going to threaten the local elite. And that's very different than where we have actually been. Okay, thank you. To the uh, rest of the panel, do you have any additional thoughts, Dr. Berry? Yeah, I just want to go back to the other question about um, how the global health community can improve capacity of non-state actors without actually going on the ground and give an example, um, is that we are living in a time of innovation where lots of folks have cell phones um, and that one could actually uh, strengthen via, and I'd like to hear how other folks are doing this with telehealth or um, telecommunications to the non-state actors um, and, and strengthen their ability to give health care. In Syria, um, there's a group of physicians that are um, actually doing uh, tele-surgery, talking people through doing surgery um, on the ground. So that I think we should start looking to some of the innovative ways in artificial intelligence and digital telehealth, which might be the next move to doing it more safely on the ground. Thank you, Ambassador. Yeah, uh, just to follow up on what uh, Stephen laid out, I, uh, I, I would agree what, what's critical to get back to the question of how do we work with uh, local actors and governments in building their uh, security forces. You know, the first question is what are the stakes involved for the uh, United States? So Steve, had, uh, I think rightfully, Stephen had rightfully said, you consider humanitarian assistance uh, in in the calculus here. You know, clearly, uh, the threat of terrorism. Clearly, as we're now moving towards the so-called great power competition era, where we look at global resources uh, that might sit in a location where we've got problems with uh, weak government or a country that's afflicted with a civil war. Uh, you know, geopolitical uh, locations that uh, might become more important. I think the Houthi case is instructive uh, in that regard. I've seen this ebb and flow in terms of how does Washington look at the, at the, the uh, civil war in Yemen. And to the extent that it might be characterized more as Iranian proxies, that's going to lead then to uh, security assistance and maybe support for the uh, Saudi effort that uh, you know, that would not would not exist. Uh, the, the second would be with regard to levels of ambition with our security force programs, in modesty and humility, that the more that we want to uh, build, you have to think about the day after the day inevitable day after when the United States doesn't have the oversight uh, that it has at the peak effort. And so if you look at, for instance, in Afghanistan, efforts to build Afghan local police, as long as these paramilitary forces, as long as special forces was out in the, uh, was out and about and could keep an eye on those forces, they did okay, mixed results, but generally okay. But when they pulled back that inevitably then those forces became predatory. And the third, in terms of, where do you put your emphasis and your resources? In the example of counterterrorism, I think the United States has found with uh, our experience that special forces have done, our special forces can do a reasonably good job as long as they're present in a country and coaching and mentoring and enabling local special forces and counterterrorism units to do reasonably well and that's, it's interesting in most cases, back to Steve's point, 
about what can be threatening to local elites. Well, in a lot of these countries we're operating in, they, they, have, they might have a degree of concern about the terrorist threat that exists within their country, but they've got a lot of other security concerns to include first and foremost staying in power, but they're willing to tolerate then Americans coming in and building elite special forces for counterterrorism missions because they recognize those forces are under American control and are not politically threatening. And then at the end of the day, they're, they're relatively small forces. And so okay, they're so not going to threaten a larger patronage network. And they're not too concerned when they go to bed at night that those forces under American control are going to uh, kick the palace doors open. Thank you. And uh, Professor Krasner, go ahead. Yeah, so I just wanted to say one more thing following up on what Michelle said. So I think we should recognize that we're in a world which is basically a sovereignty-based world. Really, it's a bizarre way to organize the international system. Um, if I just wrote a book, and what it culminated in killing hundreds of millions of people in Europe. So it's not that you'd say there's a great system. So I think Michelle's idea of using cell phones, what we should recognize is we have sovereignty. We're sort of stuck with sovereignty, but we should think about ways we can get around it. And using cell phones, it's actually a great idea. All right, thank you. Okay, I have uh, another question from my end here, and then we'll kind of take a look at the clock and see if uh, in the chat, see if there's anything else pops up. Otherwise, we'll look at closing comments after this. Um, but I this kind of this sort of jumps off um, Dr. Barry and Professor Haydman's presentations, but I. Um, just based on the conversation, I'm sure all of you will have something to, to jump in here. But so I, I noticed in uh, uh, noted in so Professor Haidman talked about how you know one of those lines of effort is you you go around the state right um, to to get to sort of the end users, and then um, Dr. Barry talked about how you know for in a pandemic sense you need to strengthen le the legit legitimacy of the government since they sort of had naturally have the you know the, the larger capacity in a way that maybe smaller groups don't, but you know, but it, I'm wondering if there's a tension in between uh, between those two things, um, or, or or is there not a tension? Does that just require more judicious assessment from our end or from other organizations' end to decide when to go around and when to strengthen and buttress? I can I can jump in on that. I I, I think there is absolutely a tension, and I, I think it has a, a great deal to do with context. I I referred specifically to cases in which states were the principal threat to human security, to conditions in which governments themselves um, pose an existential threat, if not to an entire population, then to certain segments of a population. You know, think of, of, of extreme cases like Rwanda and, and in cases like Syria or in cases like Iraq, where we have had long periods of time in which the government viewed at the time under Saddam Hussein, the majority Shia population as a threat and conducted itself in its relationship with that community accordingly. In Syria, we had an extended period of time going back to 1962, when hundreds of thousands of Kurds were stripped of citizenship in an effort to pursue programs of Arabization in the Syrian North. And so, strengthening the state under those kinds of circumstances tends to produce outcomes that reinforce those embedded structural patterns of discrimination and exclusion and marginalization, including with respect to the delivery of health care. And so under those kinds of conditions, I think we need to be willing to take a much more aggressive posture with respect to interventions that are aimed at bypassing the state. Under conditions in which you have a post-conflict uh, context in which um, the the intent of a government may be more benign, but its capacities may be more limited, or it is still wrestling, take the South African post-apartheid case, it is still wrestling to ensure the, the implementation and integrity and legitimacy of a political settlement aimed at, at reallocating political, economic, and social power. Under those kinds of conditions, I think, I think Dr. Barry's prescription was exactly right. But there is no one size fits all strategy for dealing with how we engage with governments versus 
segments of a society that may view the government in in, in as as posing uh, an extreme threat. Can I add to that? And I, you know, I'm humbled by that statement, Stephen, because uh, I I'd like to think of um, health as a, a global public good that leaders of nations would see, um, and we certainly saw in our own country that unified messaging by the government is really important. Um, and, you know, one needs to have some uh, large dissemination of health information and vaccines. So it would be really great if you could strengthen the legitimacy of a government um, around the issue of health. Now, I recognize that governments have often used health as a, um, a target. Um, I forget who it was said that one doctor, I think it was somebody, Assad or something, um, said that killing one doctor kills 400 people. Um, so I think you have that tension of uh, targeting of healthcare and health doctors. Um, but certainly I would hope that we'd be able to strengthen unified messaging around health. Thank you, Dr. Beard, and uh, to the rest of the panel, any uh, follow on thoughts on that? No? Okay. Um, well, I'm uh, looking at the clock. We're getting uh, close to the two hour time limit here. I know some folks have to jump over to execute other events. So um, I'm happy to, Ambassador, turn it back to you and to the rest of the panel for any final closing thoughts on your ends. No, thanks, uh, uh, Ian. Again, thanks to uh, Marine Corps University. Uh, let me make two uh, final comments myself and then just go around to uh, colleagues. The, the first is the the need for uh, people in the policy world, in the uh, the military and the intelligence community to, to understand and appreciate just how complex these problems are when you're talking about trying to help a country that uh, has been at war for many years, just torn apart, how to uh, try to help that country find stability and uh, find a, a coherent path forward and uh, to move beyond you know the, the simplistic models of you know three lines of effort we're going to do governance we're going to do the economy we're going to do security and as Steve had said there's all you know somehow it's going to have a good serendipitous outcome to to move beyond that and to have an understanding of just how difficult these tasks are and have an understanding of what kind of expertise do you need around the table in order to try to come up with an effective strategy. And uh, the diversity of the team that required it, it's going to depend upon the particular, uh, the particular challenge that you're facing is extraordinary. We don't have that kind of capability resident in our government. We don't have that kind of full capability resident in our intelligence and military communities. So, uh, then the task becomes identifying the Michelle Berries, identifying the Stephen Hatemans, depending upon what the conflict is, and getting them to the uh, table. And then the, the second point is with regard to the amount of time that's uh, required in order to affect long-term change. Uh, Frank Fukuyama was uh, involved in our project, and he wrote a, a very interesting essay in our Daedalus, uh, in our twin Daedalus uh, publications, which was uh, Civil War, and uh, the English Civil War, which, which uh, Frank uh, began the uh, essay with a quote from Gordon Brown, a former Prime Minister of the United Kingdom, and the, uh, the English history of Civil Wars goes back to the uh, point of the Magna Carta, where people uh, without a good understanding of English Civil War history, look at the Magna Carta as the turning point, and then the, the uh, path from that point on is towards the steady establishment of a sense of nationhood or nationalism among the, uh, the English people and later the British, and towards the establishment of rule of law. But as Frank points out in his uh, essay about every 20, 25 years, uh, beginning the first year after the Magna Carta was signed, England's back in a in a horrible civil war. So the quote from Gordon Brown was, when it comes to the establishment of the rule of law, it's the first 400 years that's the most challenging. And uh, for Americans who are very impatient, uh, very optimistic, but also very impatient, the idea that we can go into these 
uh, conflicted societies and have three or four or five year programs where the end state, so to speak, to use the parlance is rule of law is something that uh, we have to uh, re-examine and we have to have uh, great humility with. Uh, I don't know, I had to drop off for a period of time, Steve. I don't know if you talked about peacekeeping uh, operations during your presentation, but it's interesting when we looked at those peacekeeping operations under the uh, UN since the 1990s, the results aren't, aren't so bad. Uh, but the problem is that in many of those cases, uh, you're bringing more stability to the country, perhaps, but you're not necessarily getting any further down the path towards a sustainable, stable political system. And I don't know when it comes to your turn, if you wanted to comment on that, among others. But let me stop there. And, and uh, Steve. Let me emphasize something that Carl said at the beginning. Um, if you look at Afghanistan and Iraq, we we're very optimistic that any we would make these countries into consolidated democracies. Now, the great danger is that we think we can make them into consolidated democracies, but we do not think there is anything that we can do. I think what we should take away from this, this panel are things that Stephen has said and Michelle has said. There are things we can do, but we can't do as much as we would like to do. So we shouldn't despair, but we should recognize that the kind of objectives that we should pursue are limited. And Michelle? I, I, I think my takeaway point is that human and planetary health um, to prevent pandemics such as infectious diseases and climate change really transcends boundaries and transcends um, conflicts. Um, and then I would hope that the U.S., as uh, my co-speakers have um, emphasized, can really um, have a moral and humanistic approach uh, to these problems that transcend boundaries. Well, I think I'd like to pick up on a on a point that that Steve Krasner made during his comments and and what Dr. Barry just said. It, it is absolutely the case that we live in an international system organized around the principle of sovereignty. And and I would say, in fact, that um, uh, understandings of sovereignty have become more rigid uh, over the past ten or fifteen years than they had been prior to that. At the same time, it seems to me that we are uh, increasingly aware of the downsides of a system in which a rigid conception of sovereignty uh, tends to define how we think about state prerogatives. And, and again, just very quickly, an example from Syria. This is the first conflict in which the UN Security Council votes to determine who has access to humanitarian assistance, whether cross-border assistance will be able to be provided to the people living in Northwest Syria uh, is now subject to a vote by, by governments. And the argument against extending cross-border assistance into that area is a sovereignty-based argument. Uh, on the other hand, we have technologies that have been discussed uh, to some extent here on this panel that offer a number of opportunities for mitigating some of the negative effects of a rigid conception of sovereignty. And so what I think would be really very important would be to acknowledge the system we live in today to begin to take fuller and more explicit account of some of the negative consequences of that system with respect to the kinds of outcomes we've been discussing and to explore where the technologies are, but also where perhaps some of the political solutions might be for mitigating some of those negative consequences. All right, thank you very much uh, for your, your closing comments. And um, ma'am and gentlemen, uh, I'm very appreciative of your time, especially across all of these time zones to come together and make this panel happen for the benefit of our students and faculty here and for uh, the Krulak Center and MCU's wider community of interest. Uh, to our audience, I'd like to thank you again for joining today's broadcast. And make sure you join us again next week. We'll be back at our 1400 time slot. And we're excited to introduce the first of our new slate of Prelac Center non-resident fellows. We will have Colonel Zenki Marerens of the Bundeswehr and the German Institute for Defense and Strategic Studies. And he's going to give us a perspective on strategic culture or why the German armed forces are the way they are. So we hope you can join us all then. Thank you. Education is what's important. Training, preparation for the expected. Education, preparation for the unexpected.